uh, if you, you know, now if you have the capacity and time, go through the Q and A and chat sections just to try to answer some of these as well. We got a lot of questions um, for some specific scenarios. Um, you know about how many amps for a, for a specific panel, um, and a lot of questions for online resources for planning um, and incentive finding incentives. So I would say, you know, getting taking advantage of um, some like Quick Carbon CEC has um, the California Energy Commission has some resources. The switches on for multifamily properties. The um, Bayron multifamily program the bambi program has a free technical assistance so definitely take advantage of those um and now for some of the questions um just kind of a general one i think laura may have touched on this a little bit but does pg and e or other utilities uh provide home a home service capacity on their website currently they don't um, well, yeah, so they don't, but one neat thing they do provide now through Home Energy Analytics, that free service that uh, runs through pg e Home Energy Analytics will show you the, uh, the highest peak usage you've had in the past year and then tell you how much remaining space that equates to if your panel was 100 amps or 200 amps. Etc. I don't know that HEA knows your panel amperage, but they're they're giving you the ability to go to a simple subtraction or lookup. You know, just look at your panel. If it's two hundred, you've got you know thirty kilowatts of remaining space. Okay. Um, and I think uh, I'm a G may have answered this in the Q and A, but I I want to highlight it too. Some of the cost comparisons between an upsized panel alone versus the different technologies that avoid the need for upsizing. Um, you know, in this panel panel optimization, a typical cost for upsizing versus uh, optimization. Yeah, so I'll answer a little bit. I think others have more specific project information they can add on. So the question I interpreted as, what is the trade-off between paying more for upsizing versus paying for the electrification itself? And this is really, unfortunately, a case of your mileage will vary. Uh, it, a lot of it depends on whether this Panel upsizing also includes service upsizing. And if that service is over uh, overground or underground, so if it is, uh, if it's a wire hanging from the utility pole to your house versus buried underneath, generally speaking, the more the uh, uh, utility service is undergrounded, the higher the cost because you might have to dig through and so on. It also, there are other time and other constraints on it. So the cost I mentioned, one of the studies, uh, I think uh, many of the panelists and others can uh, weigh in it as well. Uh, the cost can vary anywhere from $5,000 to $30,000 for that panel and service upgrade. Uh, the panel itself could cost more depending on kind of your situation. So if you're talking about, say, putting in a, a heat pump water heater, you know those costs, depending on which one you're going to choose, are anywhere from three to, you know, five thousand dollars, all inclusive. Um, heat pump space heating could be, you know, twenty k, depending on again what you're trying to do. So, if you have to spend thirty k on upgrading your service and panel, now you're talking more than upgrading just your water heater or your uh, space conditioning system. Yeah, and I wanted to weigh in too. I was just doing a calculation yesterday for someone and it turned out the uh, the cost of pursuing the watt diet was an incremental maybe $900 if they didn't really save anything on installing the water heater themselves, which you can do with a 120 volt real easy mm -hmm. uh, versus you know who knows how many thousand dollars and how many months it would be to upsize your panel. And so it's really choose your adventure. Do you want to make life easy or uh, do you want to <laughs> go swamp the grid? And just to add on to that as well, um, a lot of low voltage, low amperage equipment, the reason why it's low voltage and low amperage is because it's higher efficiency. And so you're going to have operational cost savings as well when you go with low amperage, low voltage equipment and avoiding those panel upgrades. So that can be incorporated in the calculation as well. Right. Um, another question 
of say in our company installs a lot of heat pump water heaters but there's been pushback from a few cities regarding the new the 120 volt plug-in models because they don't believe the manufacturers are meeting the national electric code are there programs available to city building departments to educate them on heat pump technology yeah yeah i'm really glad uh, that question got asked and i think the little piece of the nec that i've heard one jurisdiction was having trouble with is not is they were not believing that the shared circuit 120 volt water heater that uses 900 watts or less which is the wattage limit for using a shared circuit 15 amps they didn't believe it should also be put on a shared circuit they they believe you should go above and beyond and they should provide value by requiring that you install a dedicated circuit for a shared circuit machine. Uh, you know, so that raises the question of, you know, can, it, or I put it in the in the Q&A, how might we have a central effort, maybe through Bayron, to help cities with climate action plans look at, you know, how, how will their building departments pursue what I call macro safety? And that is the ability to help everyone do the transition at the speed that will preserve a climate that's still livable here versus obsessing on hypotheticals that may or may not occur on a circuit. All right. Um, probably ask a couple more questions and then we'll leave it to the speakers to answer on the chat. Um, got a lot of questions of... Um, specific recommendations for some of these smart panel providers, um, particularly, you know, Jack, uh, there was one towards you for in your slides, figure four, there was an image of a modern looking PTAC unit, um, or if others want to weigh in on some smart panel brand recommendations. Um, well, there's, there's several on the market. I'm not sure if I want to endorse any particular one. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, you have to kind of, uh, there's a good resources available, I would say, through some of the agencies on board and Tom's showing one of them. <laughs> uh, but I mean, yeah, there's Pan, there's Lumen, uh, Schneider makes one, um, uh, and, and there's a few others. So I don't want to necessarily, you know, choose one over the other. I think the, the main point is, why are you choosing the smart panel, right? So uh, if you are doing this just purely for convenience, that's a different thing. You know, that's uh, that's a customer choice. But if you're doing it because you want to manage loads, then I think what you need to look at is the cap capabilities of those panel in managing the load, both at that breaker level as well as the overall kind of panel level. And I just thought I'd share something about it. You know, you might want to talk to the makers of those smart panels, and they have a number of enrolled electricians who they've qualified to install them. And so hunt for an electrician that way. But but I just thought I'd show this alternative I bought recently for $190. I was able to buy this brand uh, called Electron of a of, uh, circuit sharing device that plugs into the dryer outlet. And then the dryer plugs in here. And when the dryer stops, the car charger, which is plugged in here, resumes car charging. And if you turn the dryer back on, it pauses the car charger and resumes drying. But for 190 bucks, plug it in yourself. You know, that just took off the calculation, the smaller of those two loads, either the dryer or the car charger, whichever was smaller is off. The larger one still is in the load calculation. But these, so it's basically getting cheaper and easier. There's more products coming to market uh, to get these things done. There's also the Emporia smart charger that pauses itself. So it has CT clamps. Uh, let's see. One of, well, CT clamps, which are up on the, the panel wires, uh, the service wires feeding the panel, and it'll just pause the car charger if the panel got near its rated loading. And so then it, that's a car charger without a separate controller. It's, it comes with the $500 car charger. And then, sorry, just to, just to add with response to the question around that, that HVAC equipment in my slides, that was a, a POCA um, heat pump, packed shriveled heat pump. It's 120 volt, it's inverter driven. There's a similar product, 
Olympia, um, also inverter driven. So really high efficiency, low voltage, low amperage, around 10,000 BTUs are great, great for multifamily applications. And then just to call out for like smart splitters and smart panels and multifamily, we haven't really utilized them that often in multifamily, mainly concerns around uh, resident education and service for the residents, right? Like having uh, your dryer and your stove connected to a circuit chair in a multifamily setting can be challenging and, and letting, you know, resident education on that front can be really challenging as well. So really the approach is low amperage, low voltage, energy efficiency uh, options as well to limit how much electrical load you're adding to your electrification project. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, we do have to wrap up this first panel. Um, there are a few unanswered um, questions in the chat for this panel, so I'd love the speakers to just go in there and um, answer them in the Q&A function.